this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and here's one I know a lot of you have been waiting for. This is the Asus Tai Chi Windows 8 Notebook Convertible, 2.75 pounds or so, quite light, 11.6 inch for the Tai Chi 21. There's also a Tai Chi 31, and that one's a 13.3 inch, but what's so interesting about this? 1080p display in here, matte display, not a touch screen, but when you close it, it automatically switches to the outside display. And there you have it in its Gorilla Glass Beauty. Also 1080p, also IPS. Works with 10 fingers of multi-touch and a digital pen. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, finally, the ASUS Tai Chi. Again, this is the Tai Chi 21, which in ASUS lingo means the 11.6 inch and the 31 model is the 13.3 inch. Obviously this guy is the more portable 11.6 inches. It has been a popular size so far for convertible ultrabooks because it's not so burdensome to hold this in your hands. You see right now we're on the standard Windows desktop in desktop mode. We press our little button right there. There's our live tile interface. Ten fingers of multi-touch. We have a 1080p IPS display here. Not the world's brightest though. Display brightness is 250 to 280 nits of brightness depending on whether you're looking at the internal or the external. But it's fine for indoor use. For those of you who are going to use this outdoors though, it's, this is not one of ASUS's crazy bright 600 nit displays here. Nonetheless, it's a beautiful display. Very good contrast. A gamma calibration a little strangely off at the factory. You can tweak that if you want, but overall good, nice, rich colors. A little on the warm side. Very pleasing to look at. Uh, right up there with the, the Sony Vio Duo 11 in terms of display quality and obviously resolution and size also are matching. Now if we look at it like this, it looks kind of like a normal notebook because it also is a normal notebook. It has that ASUS taper going on, uh, sort of like the Zenbook, Zenbook Prime series and the metal casing, but it doesn't get quite as skinny. That's because the lid itself has to be thicker because it's housing two displays. On the side here you can see this is our power button right here. It's a slider button. We have our micro HDMI, a USB 3.0 port, and that's our charging port right there. On the back, a fairly normal design for hinge. You can barely see these two little rubber stipples right here. That's because when you push the display all the way back, it will actually rest on this area when it's being used in standard laptop mode. And this side here, 3.5 millimeter combo audio jack, USB 3.0 port. We have our mini VGA, which comes with a little dongle adapter, volume controls, and this is a slider lock here. You can lock this into normal laptop mode, or you can leave it in switchable mode, where when you close the lid, it's going to automatically switch to showing you a display right there. When the display is off, it just looks like a sheet of black glass. It looks like one of those Gorilla Glass clad HP Envy Spectres or the black version of the Acer Aspire S7 Ultrabook. On the bottom, usual ASUS looking Zenbook kind of thing. It's metal. You can see these are our vents right here. Stereo speakers. These are the grills on this side right there, on this side right there. Rubber feet. Lots of little teeny torque screws if you want to get inside. Not the most user upgradable thing. This is an Ultrabook after all. RAM is soldered on board on this, for example. Now, we're going to take a look inside. Now, inside here, again, it looks a lot like Zenbook, Zenbook Prime kind of materials. This is metal. It gets nice and cold in the winter, folks. Uh, good quality, well put together, definite improvement in fit and finish here for ASUS. Uh, particularly speaking of that, it, it, ASUS is known for their backlight bleed with their IPS displays, and this has fairly minimal backlight bleed on the internal and external panels. In fact, there's just about no light bleed whatsoever on the external panel. Just a little, little bit on the bottom, but no worse than our Sony Vio Duo 11, and then that's a company that we hold the high standards there. Often you're going, you're going to see a little bit of IPS backlight bleed, and that's where you can see lighter right around the edges if you're displaying a very dark background, particularly if you have the brightness cranked up and you're in a dark room, but I'm not going to be complaining about it here. And here we have our keyboard deck. This is all metal right here. Nice Zenbook Prime kind of design element. A lovely island style keyboard. Now this keyboard is small. It's actually quite easy to type on. Good tactile feel. Decent amount of key travel, especially for something that this, that's this small. Certainly better than the Vio Duo 11 with its pint-sized keyboard, thanks to the slider design. Not quite as good as the Dell XPS. 12's keyboard, but that's one of the best keyboards on the market. So I think that most people who spend a lot of time typing are going to enjoy this keyboard quite a lot. Got our little cluster of arrow keys here. You can see everything is a normal layout. Our FN row up top does double duty as usual with the multimedia and control keys. 
And that is not switchable in BIOS. It used to be with ASUS computers and many others. You could switch in BIOS so you didn't have to hit the FN key, say if you want to turn wireless on and off or change your keyboard brightness or your display brightness, you're going to have to use the FN key. Not the end of the world. Something real special right here is what they call the Tai Chi key, which is looks a little bit like a yin-yang symbol. And if you press that, it's going to bring up right here. So up here in the corner, these are the important guys, and you can actually use this either on the touch screen this application or right here, but right now we're in standard notebook mode, you can see that that's selected, and then if we select the next one over, we can put it to manually be on the back screen, which you can also do just by closing the notebook, but say you just want to use it with it upright like this, so you can kind of use it in presentation mode, that works. And then we have mirror mode, so whatever we're seeing here, we're going to see on the outside, useful for presentations, content sharing. Imagine if you're, you're playing a game and you want somebody to watch and see what you're doing. You can actually just do that. It's pretty cool. And the last one, on the far corner right there, actually gives you two different screens. So I was functioning like having dual monitors running independently. So I can be running an application here, say I'm, I'm surfing a, the web here and I've got a movie playing on the back that my kid can watch. Or if you're doing something business-wise, you can do a presentation. You can have PowerPoint running in presentation mode on the back while you're looking at your deck of presentation slides on the front. So, interesting, certainly, way to use a notebook computer with that possibility of content sharing there. And that's what the two displays gets you. So what do you get in the Tai Chi? Now we're talking about the Tai Chi 21 again, the 11.6 inch. And you can get that with either a Core i5 1.7 gigahertz or a Core i7 1.9 gigahertz ULV CPU, your typical Ultrabook CPU selections. The base model is the i5 with 128 gig SSD SATA 3 interface, and the higher end model is the i7 with 256 gig SSD, and both of them have 4 gigs of DDR3 1600 megahertz RAM. Now ours has a SanDisk 256 gig drive in here, and I know with a past Zenbook Prime some of you have been bothered if you've got a SanDisk drive. This is a new redesigned drive, much faster, very good drive speeds on this, so absolutely no complaints with that. It looks like it's going to be SanDisk all around this time for the drives that are used in here. So no complaints, very good transfer speeds according to our disk tests. Good stuff. As you saw, it has two USB 3.0 ports, really a good selection of ports for such a little machine. It has mini, the micro HDMI out and mini VGA. You get adapter actually to bring that up to full VGA in the box and you get your 3.5 millimeter combo jack. There is no SD card slot in the 11 inch model. There is one in the 13 inch model. As with past Zenbooks, ASUS includes this little ballistic nylon pouch here that holds two adapters. This is your VGA adapter, still wrapped in plastic, so that plugs into the mini VGA port. It gives you a standard VGA output for those of you who have legacy monitors and projectors. And you also get 10100 USB Ethernet right here. It plugs into your USB port. It gives you RJ45 Ethernet included in the box. Power adapter is the usual mono block kind of wall work connector with lots of long skinny cord right here to plug into the wall. So it's pretty portable certainly compared to a lot of other adapters. And again typical of Zenbooks you also get the ballistic nylon carrying pouch with a nice soft micro suede interior so you've got something to carry your nice new expensive notebook around because these are expensive folks. You're spending about a hundred bucks extra to get that second 1080p display, which really actually isn't that bad a price if you find that an appealing feature to add only a hundred bucks on for that. But we're talking $12.99 for the Core i5 with 128 gig SSD and $15.99 for the Core i7 with 256 gig SSD. No matter which one you choose, you're going to get the internal 1080p display right here, matte anti-glare, just like we saw on the Zenbook Prime. Certainly graphic artists are going to appreciate that. The high resolution, the anti-glare finish on this, this still has pretty good viewing angles. Hard to beat, no reflections. Also easier on the eyes, even if you just spend a lot of time typing in an office where there's a lot of glary overhead lights. And the rear display is also IPS 1080p resolution. You've got a webcam with microphone right up here, 720p webcam up front. On the outside, you've got a 5 megapixel 1080p camera placed below the display or above the display, depending on how you rotate the bugger. One thing that will probably drive you crazy until you get used to it, if you ever do, is the fact that this is not a touch screen on the inside. Once you get used to touching the thing and given the Windows 8 interface right here, it comes with full Windows 8, by the way, uh, it's a little weird that you have to use the trackpad instead. Can't touch here, all you're going to get is fingerprints if you do. 
That said, this trackpad here, nice, oversized trackpad, something we've never been able to say about ASUS trackpads before. They, they used to be really designed just to torture you, in my opinion. This one works well. The gestures work fine. You can do the swiping in from the sides. You can do the two-finger multi-touch to scroll. All of that works just fine. How about performance? We'll take a look at our Windows Experience Index right here as we switch back to desktop mode. And I can tell you that on PC Mark 7 Benchmark, it scored a 49.52, which is quite good and about what we would expect from a higher-end Core i7 ULV Ultrabook with an SSD drive. And here's our Windows Experience Index. On a scale of 0 to 9.9, we get 7.1 for the processor. 5.9 for the RAM, 5.6 for desktop graphics, 6.4 for gaming graphics and 3D graphics, and 8.1 for the primary hard disk. Now, despite the robust gaming score there, this is an Ultrabook with Intel HD 4000 integrated graphics only. No dedicated GPU here. You are not going to be playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 latest version at high frame rates and native resolution on this. Older games, casual games, games from the Windows Store, oh, they play just fine. World of Warcraft, yeah, at 1366 by 768 if you drop down the resolution, you can run that at about 50 frames per second or so. So, there you have it. Uh, Ultrabooks are just not serious gaming machines, but you, you can get away with some gaming on this, and certainly less demanding games like Left 4 Dead 2 play just fine on this. Since this is full Windows 8, you can install all of your Windows 7 applications, x86, exe apps, whatever you want to call them. For example, we have Photoshop installed on here. We're going to show you how that runs, because that's of interest certainly to you graphic designer types. And now we're in Adobe Photoshop CS664 bit. 1080p matte display, very nice for photo editing. Like I said, reasonable color accuracy. I would adjust the gamma if I were you, if I was a graphics professional. But other than that, works just fine. And we're going to import a 15 meg raw file here. And there we've got imported, took a little bit longer than say it would on a full Core i7 non-mobile CPU on your desktop, but hey, for an Ultrabook that wasn't bad at all. And we're going to apply a little camera adjustment for a Sony Alpha digital camera that we use and open up that image. It's an 18 megapixel image, so we're giving it a good challenge. And there's our image, and say we want to apply some filters to it and test this out a bit. We'll do an unsharp mask with the default values. Previews pretty quick. That was fast enough for me. And now we'll rotate the image. So certainly once you get the, Im the image imported, it works just fine. And again, a pleasure to work on that. And if, say, you want to use this on the outside display, let's just close this and see how it goes. So here it is, and now we can use the digital pen because uh, using your fingers with Photoshop isn't my idea of fun, so we can do things like... So we can do things like, say we want to undo that rotation. Works just fine. If you want to draw on this, yes you can do that. If you want to use the selection tool, for example, I just want to select the red chair right here. Easy peasy. One thing you're not going to get is pressure sensitivity. This is, comes with an N-trig